Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to join us today. We'll give it just another minute or two for more people to join, and we'll be starting this meeting shortly. It's a little after 2 p.m. Pacific, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name's Pam Chanel, and I'll be your meeting facilitator today. Again, thank you for taking the time to join us. Before we get started, I'd like to note that the presentation portion of the meeting is being recorded and will be available on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's project website within five business days. We are now starting the public meeting for the Draft Environmental Impact Statement, or Draft EIS, for the Elliott State Research Forest Habitat Conservation Plan, or HCP. I'd like to review our agenda for this afternoon. We'll spend the first few minutes reviewing the meeting purpose, as well as Zoom webinar tips and some troubleshooting. Then we'll move into our presentations. Shauna Everett, staff lead for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, commonly referred to as the Service, or FWS, will start us off with a welcome and an overview of the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, process. Then Melissa Klungel from the ICF HCP team, who led the preparation of the HCP for the Oregon Department of State Lands, or DSL, will provide an overview of the Elliott State Research Forest HCP. Then Deb Bartley from the ICF EIS team, who led the preparation of the EIS for the service, will provide an overview of the draft EIS. Then Lydia Dad, also from the ICF EIS team, will explain how and where to submit comments on the HCP and the draft EIS and review next steps. Please note that we are not taking oral co public comments as part of this meeting. All comments must be submitted in writing, online, or via mail. Lydia will review how to submit your comments during this presentation. After the presentations, we'll move into our question and answer session. Please feel free to submit your questions via the Zoom Q&A feature at any time during the presentation this afternoon. At 3.25, we'll begin to wrap up. If there are additional questions, we'll stay online through 4 p.m. Pacific. And while we're sure many of you have been following the development of the proposed Elliott State Research Forest HCP closely, we'd like to go ahead and review the purpose for today's meeting. We'll be providing information on the NEPA review process for federal agency decisions on incidental take permits associated with the Elliott State Research Forest HCP. We're also here to provide information on the proposed HCP and the draft EIS, which were recently released for public comment. And we'll walk through the process for submitting formal public comments on the draft EIS and HCP. And finally, today is an opportunity to ask clarifying questions on the proposed HCP and draft EIS via this virtual meeting. Questions asked here today will not be recorded as formal public comments on the draft EIS or HCP. However, as I mentioned, we'll walk through how to submit written comments via regulations.gov and we'll answer any questions that you have about that process. Just a reminder to our public meeting attendees this afternoon that you will be muted throughout the webinar. If you're having logistical issues with Zoom webinar, please notify our team using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. If you're having audio issues, please make sure that your Zoom audio settings are connected to your computer or device speakers, and please check your audio settings button. If you continue to have audio issues, you may also join this webinar via phone by calling in toll free to 888-788-0099. The webinar ID is 
2904. And the passcode is E-S-R-F-H-C-P-E-I-S. -E Our host will drop this information into the chat box. Additionally, as I mentioned, we'll be accepting questions via the Q&A feature. Please feel free to submit your question at any time throughout the presentation. And we'll be addressing questions after the presentations at approximately 3 p.m. Please note that any questions submitted into the chat or the Q&A feature are not considered official public comments. A recording of the presentation portion of this meeting will be placed on the Services Project website, and we'll present that web address on a later slide, and our host will also drop it into the chat box. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Shauna Everett with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Welcome, and thank you, Pam, for opening our virtual public meeting. My name is Shauna Everett. I'm a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Oregon Field Office and staff lead for the Elliott State Research Forest Project. On behalf of the service, I'd like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. To provide some context for what has led up to this point, the service and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, commonly referred to as NOAA Fisheries, and which I'll refer to collectively as the services, are considering issuing permits to the applicant, the Oregon Department of State Lands, or DSL, that would authorize incidental take of listed species that could occur from DSL's research and forest management activities in the Elliott State Research Forest. Take, as defined under the Endangered Species Act, means to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect, or to attempt to engage in any such conduct. Incidental take is an unintentional but not unexpected taking. Section 10 of the ESA allows incidental take of threatened endangered species if take occurs under an approved HCP. And HCP is the applicant's plan, so in this case, DSL's plan to avoid, minimize, and compensate or mitigate for the permitted take. The proposed issuance of an incidental take permit is considered a federal action under the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. The service is the lead federal agency preparing the EIS under NEPA, and NOAA Fisheries, the Oregon Department of Forestry, or ODF, and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, or ODFNW, are cooperating agencies. The IS is going to evaluate the effects of the proposed federal action on the broader environment, not just the covered species. The services have roles under both NEPA and the Federal Endangered Species Act, and this figure depicts the steps in these parallel processes, with NEPA on the left and ESA on the right. So under NEPA, as the lead agency for NEPA, the service-led preparation of the draft EIS as cooperating agencies for NEPA, NOAA Fisheries, ODF, and ODFW provided technical expertise and document review. The service will review and consider all comments received during this comment period in preparation of the final EIS. Both the service and NOAA Fisheries will prepare records of decision at the conclusion of the NEPA process to document their decisions. On the ESA side, both the service and NOAA Fisheries have provided technical assistance to DSL in the development of the HCP. Each agency is responsible for making an incidental take permit decision for the listed species under their jurisdiction. Each agency will also prepare a Section 7 biological opinion documenting whether the proposed action would jeopardize the continued existence of the covered species or result in the destruction or adverse modification of critical habitat, and Section 10 findings documenting whether the HCP satisfies statutory and regulatory requirements. To evaluate whether or not to issue an incidental take permit, the services must each separately consider the following issuance criteria. Those are, the taking will be incidental to an otherwise lawful activity, the impacts will be minimized and mitigated to the maximum extent practical, adequate funding will be provided, the taking will not appreciably reduce the likelihood of the survival and recovery of the species, and any other necessary measures are met. So to reiterate, the action being considered by the services is whether or not to issue incidental take permits. The HCP is the applicant, DSL's document. The services have been providing and will continue to provide technical assistance to DSL as they finalize the HCP. So the services review is ongoing. This is an applicant-driven process and the contents of the HCP are at the discretion of Department of State Lands. If the issuance criteria are met, the services can issue the permits. 
Other options are to deny the permit or to issue the permit with conditions. That concludes our brief overview of the NEPA and ESA processes. Next, I'd like to introduce Melissa Klungel from ICF. Melissa has led the preparation of the HCP for DSL and will provide an overview of the proposed HCP. Thank you, Shauna, for your presentation and introductions. As Shauna just mentioned, I'm Melissa Klungel with ICF and I'm the HCP project manager supporting DSL with the development of their HCP. Today, I'm gonna to provide an overview of the HCP and then hand it over to Deb to discuss the NEPA process. I'd like to start with an overview of what we'll be discussing today, which includes purpose, why is DSL pursuing an HCP, HCP components in an organization, including the following key topics, geographic area, permit term, covered species and activities, conservation strategy, the monitoring and adaptive management plan, and in closing, we'll touch on the HCP development process and public engagement. So why an HCP? The purpose of the HCP is to ensure compliance with the Endangered Species Act. Currently, the Elliott State Research Forest is under custodial management and not being harvested due to the presence of ESA listed species. The development of an HCP and issuance of an incidental take permit would allow the Department of State Lands to be compliant with the Endangered Species Act while continuing to perform the covered activities, which includes harvest in the permit area. The HCP provides deliberate planned conservation to avoid, minimize, and mitigate for taking a federally listed species. Further, the HCP provides certainty around how the land will be managed for DSL and the federal agencies. This slide provides an overview of how the public draft HCP is organized. I won't be discussing each chapter today, but rather focusing on key components of the document. The Elliott State Research Forest, which is represented in green on this map, is approximately 83,000 acres of land located in Coos and Douglas County. And if we zoom in on that more, we can see how the plan and permit area are laid out. The plan area, which is shown on this map with black and in some cases overlapping red line, includes all common school lands denoted by green, as well as board of forestry lands, which are shown in yellow. The permit area, which is where the covered activities and conservation actions will occur, is denoted by the green color and red outline. Board of Forestry lands, which again are in yellow, are part of the plan area and are not in the permit area. These lands are part of the Western Oregon State Forest HCP. If a land exchange were to occur in the future, these lands could be covered under the Elliott State Research Forest HCP. This HCP has an 80-year permit term. This 80 year term was really selected to balance the risks associated with either shorter or longer terms. A term of less than 80 years would substantially reduce DSL's regulatory certainty to conduct long term forest management practices and research activities. In addition, the length of the permit term was also selected to support the implementation of a successful conservation strategy. The covered species are those species for which DSL are requesting take authorization from Fish and Wildlife Service and NIMS. The covered species were selected based on a review of all species of conservation concern known or suspected to incur in the plan area during the permit term. Criteria that are reviewed to include for coverage include range, do they occur in the permit area, status, um, are they listed, proposed, or have a strong likelihood to be listed over the course of the permit term, Impact, habitat would potentially be affected, and data, is there existing data on the species life history, habitat requirements, and occurrence to adequately evaluate potential effects of covered activities and develop conservation measures to mitigate those impacts. Based on the criteria I just described, this HCP covers three species, marbled murrelet, northern spotted owl, and Oregon coast coho. This HCP is intended to cover and provide incidental take authorization for research activities as well as those activities needed to carry out the conservation strategy. These activities include research design and allocation, including research actions, harvest activities, intensive, extensive, and reserves, as well as stand management activities that will be utilized to maintain the research platform. Supporting management activities. These are activities that will be used to facilitate stand management, such as mechanical vegetation control and controlled burning. 
and also supporting infrastructure, which includes development and maintenance of roads, landing, drainage structures, quarries, and research facilities that are required to facilitate the implementation of the research platform and programs. There are some activities that are not covered by this HCP, and those include recreation, herbicides, and fire suppression. In the last slide, I touched on the research design. I now want to spend some time walking through those forest management types. Designated reserves are just that, reserves. They cover about 65% of the permit area and will be managed for the benefit of the covered species and public values. These areas will not be actively harvested, but a single entry thin may occur in stands that are less than 65 years old as of 2020, during the first 20 years of the permit term to accelerate the development of older forest conditions. Intensive treatments or production-oriented stands will be research treatments that are used to investigate management options for emphasizing wood fiber production at rotations of 60 years or longer. Harvest will be limited to those stands that are less than 65 years old, again, as of 2020, and all activities will comply with the Oregon Forest Practices Act and other applicable state and federal regulations. So I've talked about intensive and extensive, which provide opportunities to study management extremes. I now want to discuss extensive treatment. These treatments are aimed at looking at the continuum between intensive and reserves to find a way to perform forest management activities that can have multiple benefits. The goal of extensive treatment is to retain or create structural complexity while ensuring conditions exist to obtain regeneration and sustain complex forest structure through time. Extensive treatments will be limited to stands that were established following the 1868 fire or regeneration harvests that have occurred primarily since the 1950s. These treatments will have, on average, 50% less fiber production per acre compared to intensive. Last is the riparian conservation areas, or RCAs, which are stream-adjacent forests that will be buffered from harvest. The focus, of riparian, <clears throat> the focus of the riparian approach is on maintaining key ecological processes that influence the productivity of aquatic ecosystems and associated resources. As described previously for reserves, a single entry thin may occur in stands in the riparian conservation areas that are less than 65 years old as of 2020. This again would be occurring during the first 20 years of the permit term with the goal to reduce the density of existing plantations and accelerate the development of forest conditions that would benefit the aquatic ecosystem. So this graphic shows how those management areas I just described are laid out across the Elliott State Research Forest. The conservation research watershed shown in green will be managed as a large reserve, whereas the management research watershed, which is the patchwork colors, patchwork of colors kind of to the right here, is comprised of intensive, extensive, and reserve treatments, including RCAs. The goal of this research design is to facilitate a long-term experiment to determine an optimal forest management scheme that will promote biodiversity and ecosystem processes and services. At a high level, the HCP conservation strategy establishes the biological goals and objectives for each of the covered species. In addition, it describes the HCP conservation commitments, which will be achieved through the implementation of the research design, conservation measures, and conditions on covered activities. Conditions on covered activities are in place to minimize effects, while conservation measures offset effects that cannot be minimized. As part of the conservation strategy, DSL has committed to the development of an interagency stakeholder advisory committee. This committee will participate in the planning process for research and monitoring, and will include participants from DSL, OSU, Fish and Wildlife Service, NIMPS, ODFW, Board of Directors of the Elliott State Research Forest, as well as subject matter experts that are not affiliated with other entities I just described. So now I'm going to highlight the biological goals and objectives or BGOs and associated conservation strategies for each of the covered species, starting with Oregon Coast Coho. The goal for Oregon Coast Coho is to contribute to the persistence of the evolutionary significant unit directly and indirectly by restoring ecological attributes and processes that benefit multiple life histories of the three independent populations in the permit area, 
as well as downstream reaches outside the permit area. This will be achieved through promoting the recruitment of large wood and supporting the continual improvement in water quality and quantity. Under the HCP, 65% of the permit area will be in reserves, which means they will have full protection due to no harvest occurring. Riparian conservation areas will be maintained within all management areas, conservation and management research watersheds as part of the covered activities. Riparian conservation areas will vary in size and configuration according to stream type and upslope research treatment and will be delineated using horizontal distance. These riparian conservation areas will protect in-stream processes and promote delivery of wood. In addition, a number of conservation measures have been identified in the aquatic conservation strategy to mitigate effects of HCP implementation. These include the expansion of RCAs in the lower Millicoma River, which is in the management research watershed to benefit the Coos population of Coho. Installation of restoration and stream enhancement projects to improve aquatic function in the short term and create self-sustaining habitats over the long term. And a conservation measure committing to the reduction in forest road network in the conservation research watershed. In addition to those conservation measures, conditions on covered activities are also included for actions such as road construction and maintenance, as well as management on steep slopes to minimize effects to the covered species. The biological goal for Northern Spotted Owl is to retain and enhance existing nesting, roosting, and foraging habitat and increase the availability of these habitats in the Elliott. The measurable metrics for each of these habitats is shown on this slide as objectives. Under this HCP, 80% of modeled nesting, roosting, and foraging habitat is located in designated reserves where there will be no harvest. Furthermore, when you combine those reserves with extensive or ecological forestry management prescriptions where up to 80% of pre-harvest stand density will be retained. The 93% of nesting, roosting, and foraging habitat is protected. Only 7% of modeled habitat is included in areas that will be subject to intensive treatments. In these areas, the HCP establishes specific retention requirements to protect the nesting, roosting, and foraging habitat. And of the 23 known nest locations for Northern Spotted Owl on the Elliott, 12 are located in the conservation research watershed and 11 are in the management research watershed. Of those 11 in the management research watershed, seven are in areas designated as reserve, two are located in riparian conservation areas, and two are in areas that could be subject to intensive treatments. Again, this is where the HCP establishes specific retention requirements protecting nesting, roosting, and foraging habitat. The biological goal for marbled murrelet is to increase occupied and potential nesting habitat in the Elliott State Research Forest. This will be accomplished by retaining and enhancing 1,800 acres of occupied and 14,000 acres of potential, and that's supposed to be 18,000, I apologize of potential marbled murrelet nesting habitat in the permit area, as well as increasing suitable marbled murrelet nesting habitat by 21,000 acres by the end of the permit term. Under the HCP, 84% of designated occupied and 90% of modeled potential marbled murrelet habitat will be placed in designated reserves where no harvest will occur. These stands may be managed to develop older forest structure as described previously and would follow seasonal restrictions. No designated occupied habitat will be subject to intensive harvest, regardless of stand age. Extensive harvest can occur as part of the research program designed to study murrelet nesting behavior in response to forest management activities, but harvest will not exceed 1,400 acres. Of those 1,400 acres, no more than 500 acres will be actively managed within the first 10 years of the permit. Up to an additional 900 acres may be managed thereafter, subject to outcomes of the initial research and Fish and Wildlife Service review and concurrence of proposed research plans and objectives. Last, there will be no temporal loss of the aggregate number of acres of designated occupied or modeled potential habitat as a result of harvest treatments in the permit area.
A monitoring and adaptive management program will be required to track DSL's compliance with the HCP and progress towards meeting the HCP's biological goals and objectives, including the response of the covered species to the implementation of covered activities and conservation measures. There are two types of monitoring, compliance and effectiveness. Compliance monitoring documents that the requirements of the HCP and permit are being met while effectiveness monitoring assesses the biological success of the HCP. Monitoring will look at long-term trends using a three-year rotation for each species. This rotation will cover one-third of the terrestrial species habitat in any given year and one independent population of coho per year. Outcomes of the monitoring program, as well as the research findings, will feed into the adaptive management program to inform and change management actions to continually improve outcomes for the covered species. The HCP has been under development since 2018, and during that time, DSL has been working with Oregon State University, federal and state partners to develop the public draft that is currently out for review. In addition to the coordination I just described, DSL has also led stakeholder meetings throughout the process, as well as meeting with members of the Elliott Advisory Committee and representatives of a number of interest groups. Input received during these engagements have been fed into the HCP process to develop the public draft that is out today for review. That concludes my overview of the HCP. Next, I would like to introduce Deb Bartley from ICF. As described by Shauna previously, Deb is supporting Fish and Wildlife Service with the development of the EIS. Thanks, Melissa, and, and thank you, Shauna, for your presentations. Uh, I'm Deb Bartley with ICF, and I'm serving as the NEPA project manager, supporting the service in EIS development. <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to walk through the overview an overview of the draft EIS and then I'll pass it to Lydia Dad, um, deputy PM on this project to cover next steps and how to comment. What uh, must the EIS address? So starting with the big picture, an, an EIS needs to address input from public tribes, agencies, and stakeholders, the purpose and need for the federal action a reasonable range of alternatives and the effects of the proposed action and alternatives on the human environment. And we'll cover each of these on the following slides. Scoping is the first formal step in the NEPA process. And during scoping, the public tribes, organizations, and agencies assist in the development of the EIS by identifying important issues, information, and alternatives to the proposed action that should be considered in the EIS. The service formally initiated the scoping period on May 5th of this year by publishing a notice of intent to prepare an EIS. The public comment period was from May 5th to June 6th and a scoping meeting was held on May 16th. All the comments that we received during scoping were reviewed and considered in the development of alternatives and in determining the scope of analysis of effects in the draft EIS. So in addition to the proposed action, an EIS must consider a reasonable range of alternative courses of action that meet the purpose and need and are technically and economically feasible. The service conducted an alternatives evaluation process that's, that was based on federal implementing regulations for NEPA. And this process and its outcomes are described in chapter two of the EIS. As part of this process, the service consulted its cooperating agencies and DSL for their exp expertise and input on technical issues. And the alternatives evaluated in this process included suggestions made in scoping comments. Ultimately, the service as the lead agency was responsible for making the decision about which alternatives were analyzed in detail in the EIS. And two action alternatives, in addition to the proposed action and no action were included for detailed study. And I will describe each of these on the next slides. Alternative one is the no action alternative. Analysis of a no action alternative is required under NEPA. The no action serves as a baseline with which to compare impacts of the proposed action and any action alternatives. 
Under the no action alternative, the services would not issue incidental take permits to DSL and DSL would not implement the proposed HCP and research design. Take of listed species would not be authorized and DSL would continue to be subject to ESA, the Forest Practices Act, as well as other federal, state and local requirements. For purposes of analysis, the no action alternative assumes that DSL would manage the forest for timber harvest using a take avoidance approach to ESA compliance. Alternative two is the proposed action or proposed HCP, which Melissa just presented an overview of. To provide a brief review, under the proposed action, the services would issue permits authorizing incidental take of the covered species from the covered activities in the permit area for an 80 year permit term. And DSL would implement the proposed HCP, including the conservation strategy and adaptive management and monitoring program. Both action alternatives three and four would also include implementation of an HCP and issuance of take permits. Alternative three would modify the proposed HCP conservation strategy by redesignating some stands in intensive and extensive treatment areas under the proposed action to reserves, applying Northern Spotted Owl habitat requirements and conservation conditions to any future activity centers in addition to current activity centers, expanding riparian conservation areas on certain stream types, applying the no net increase in roads requirement to the full permit area, as opposed to just the conservation research watersheds under the proposed action, and including additional requirements for road decommissioning. Alternative four, the increased harvest alternative, would modify the proposed HCP conservation strategy by redesignating some stands that are in reserves under the proposed action to intensive or extensive treatments depending on age. Applying the repairing conservation area widths identified for the management research watersheds under the proposed action to the full permit area, basically removing conservation measure two, and removing the requirement for no net increase in roads in the conservation research watersheds. The draft EIS analyzes potential direct indirect and cumulative impacts of the proposed action and alternatives on the 12 resource areas listed on this slide. And I will provide an overview of impacts identified in the draft EIS um, on several of these resources on the next slide. So the types of impacts on the environment would be the same under all of the alternatives because all of the alternatives include forest management activities and differences in restrictions on the location and intensity of activities would drive differences in effects with harvest being the primary driver. This figure provides a snapshot of projected forest development based on differences in restrictions under the <clears throat> restrictions on harvest under the alternatives at the end of the 80 year analysis period. The lighter colors indicate um, younger stands and the darker greens, older stands. You can see the legend in the top right there. And as you can hopefully see from this slide, the no action alternative one and the increased harvest alternative four have greater areas of younger stands from more intensive harvest, while the proposed action alternative two and the increased conservation alternative three have more areas of late seral and old growth forest stands. And you can also see on these figures that there's greater connectivity between these older stands with alternatives two and three. Forest stand age affects uh, many resources, including carbon storage, water resources, and fish and wildlife habitat as well. Um, and we'll review, we'll review the some of these on the subsequent slides here. Starting with climate change effects, forest management activities of both negative and positive effects. 
forest management activities would emit greenhouse gases through vehicle and equipment use and prescribed burns, while forest stands, vegetation, and soils would sequester and store carbon from the atmosphere. Under all alternatives, the amount of carbon sequestered would far exceed the amount of carbon released, resulting in a net increase in carbon sequestration over the permit term. And the figure on the right of this slide shows the estimated net annual increase in carbon sequestration under the proposed action and alternatives with net carbon sequestration being greatest under alternative three, the increased conservation alternative and lowest under alternative four, the increased harvest alternative. Northern, but for the HCP's covered terrestrial species, northern spotted owl and marbled murrelet, the primary effects of forest management would be habitat removal, modification, and fragmentation, as well as species and habitat disturbance from operation of vehicles and heavy machinery. Forest, the forest stand age projections you saw on the previous slide were used to evaluate anticipated habitat for these species under the alternatives. Habitat as represented by late seral and old growth stands is projected to increase by the end of the analysis period under all alternatives except for the increased harvest alternative four. And the amount of habitat at the end of the analysis period is projected to be 10% greater under the proposed action than the no action alternative and 20% greater under the increased conservation alternative three. As shown on the figure of projected forest stand age, um, connectivity of these older stands would also be greater under the proposed action and the increased conservation alternative. Under all HCP alternatives, the proposed research and monitoring and adaptive management program would provide some additional benefits compared to the no action. The proposed research is expected to benefit conservation of the species beyond the study area. And the monitoring and adaptive management program would inform understanding of trends in species habitat abundance and distribution and facilitate updates to the HCP implementation based on new information and advances in forest management techniques. Harvest and road construction are the primary drivers of effects on coho habitat quality. And under all alternatives, these activities would have adverse effects on coho habitat quality by affecting wood recruitment potential, sedimentation, stream temperature, stream flows, and habitat complexity, quantity, and connectivity, while riparian, riparian conservation areas, reserves, restoration thinning, stream restoration, road vacating, and steep slope protections would reduce these adverse effects and in some cases have beneficial effects on coho quality, habitat quality. Um, in comparison, under the proposed action, coho populations in the conservation research watershed would experience reduced adverse effects and increased beneficial effects compared to the no action related to reduced area of clear cut harvest, wider riparian buffers, and additional limits on road construction. In the research and the management research watersheds effects are expected to be similar to the no action. The increased conservation alternative three would further decrease adverse effects and increase beneficial effects compared to the proposed action uh, through decreased harvest and increased riparian protections. And effects under the increased harvest alternative would fall between the no action and the proposed action. And under all HCP alternatives, the proposed research would have some additional benefits for coho salmon. The proposed research, which is designed at the sub watershed level, would inform effects of uh, forest practices on coho population health in the study area and statewide. And the monitoring and adaptive management program would assist in tracking how coho habitat responds to management 
and allow for adjustments to management actions. Under all alternatives, harvest activities in the permit area would generate timber sales revenue and jobs and income related uh, in related forestry logging and milling industries and in communities more broadly. Jobs and income in these industries would be greatest under the no action alternative and alternative for increased harvest. The proposed action and HCP alternatives would also generate jobs and labor income in research and education industries. Under all alternatives, timber harvest would generate government revenue. The amount of revenue generated would fluctuate as the forest matures and the volume of timber of harvestable age changes. Under the no action, timber sales re timber sale revenues would be transferred to the common school fund, whereas under the HCP alternatives, these revenues would fund the research program. All alternatives would produce government revenues through the forest products, harvest tax and other state taxes, and revenue from these taxes would be anticipated to be highest under the no action, followed by uh, alternative four, the proposed action, and alternative three. And that concludes uh, our overview of the draft EIS. I'm going to pass to Lydia Dad, who is Deputy Project Manager for the EIS, to review next steps and um, how to provide comment. Hello, as Deb said, I'm Lydia Dad from ICF, and I'm the Deputy Project Manager for the EIS, and I will review next steps in the process and how to provide comments on the draft EIS. As we noted earlier, a recording of the presentation portion of this meeting will be made available on the Services Project website, which is listed on the slide and will be pasted into the chat again. Um, requests for post-meeting translation will be accommodated as needed uh, if requested to Shauna Everett at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Her email address is on this slide, and I'll read it for those on the phone. It is Shauna underscore Everett at fws.gov. The public review and comment period is currently scheduled to close on January 3rd, 2023. However, the service received requests for an extension of the comment period and will be extending it through January 10th, 2023. A notice of extension will be published in the Federal Register in the next week. And once that notice is published, the service will update the project website to reflect this new deadline for public comments. Comments should be submitted via regulations.gov or by mail, and I'll review both of these options in the next slides. The service will review and consider all comments received on the draft EIS and HCP in preparing the final EIS, which is anticipated to be released in summer 2023. And the services will issue a record of decision no so sooner than 30 days after publication of the final EIS. Okay, some instructions on providing written public comments. Again, comments will be accepted through the close of the comment period, which is currently January 3rd, but is being extended to January 10th. Comments will be reviewed by both services, so there's no need to submit comments separately to each agency. And all comments are available to view at regulations.gov. If you are providing comments on regulations.gov, uh, comments must be submitted by the end of the day on the final day of the comment period to be considered official comments. So again, that will be January 10th. And if you are mailing in your comments via US Post, they must be postmarked no later than the last day of the comment period. To submit comments online, visit www.regulations.gov and enter the docket ID, which is on the slide, um, will be pasted into the chat, and which I'll read aloud as well. The docket ID number is FWS-R1-ES-2022-0029. And again, it'll be in the chat as well. And you can either type your comment directly into regulations.gov or upload your comment letter as an attachment. If you are mailing in your comment, the letter must be sent to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service headquarters at the address on this slide. I will read it aloud for those who called in. The address is 
Public Comments Processing, Attention, Docket Number FWS-R1-ES-2022-0029, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Headquarters, comma, MS, colon, PRB, slash, 3W, 5275 Leesburg Pike, that's L-E-E-S-B-U-R-G, Pike, P-I-K-E, in Falls Church, Virginia, 22041-3803. Please note that you do not need to submit online and mailed in comments. All comments will be considered equally whether they're submitted online or by mail. Some tips for making effective comments. First, please be as specific as possible. Avoid simply stating opposition or support or making broad general statements. Submit comments that are clear, concise, and relevant to the project as these are the most effective comments. The purpose of your comments is to help review the plan and improve our analysis in the draft EIS. Please also clearly distinguish between HCP and EIS comments. This will help us correlate your comments with the proper document. Please provide specific references and cite sources or sections of the document wherever possible. This will help us provide specific responses. And a few final reminders, please focus comments on relevant topic areas, including adequacy, clarity, and conclusions of the analysis, ESA and NEPA requirements, EIS alternatives considered, your areas of expertise, and any perceived errors or omissions. And finally, to stay informed on the NEPA process, please visit the Services Project website, which is here on the slide. And for information on the HCP process, please visit the Department of State Lands website, also listed on this slide, and both websites are being posted to the chat. Um, that concludes my portion of the presentation, and I'll hand it back to our facilitator, Pam, to lead the question and answer session. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. We'll now move into the question and answer session. Just so you're aware, we don't have any new information or additional slides following the question and answer session. So you're welcome to leave if you don't have a question, or you're also welcome to stay and listen. Please note that we will not be recording the question and answer session. As a reminder, this question and answer session